At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Welcome to Drug Science Podcast. Uh, today I have an anthropologist, an expert on plants and ethnopharmacology, Wade Davis. Welcome, Wade. Thanks, Dave. You were just telling me you're now an honorary Colombian. Maybe that's an interesting place to start. How did you get interested in this and how, why have you achieved this rather unusual status? Well, you know, I first came to Colombia as a young boy at 14 when my mother said that Spanish was the language of the future. And she was a very humble but determined Canadian woman. And she worked all year as a secretary in a small school to save enough money for me to join a, a group of schoolboys that a teacher was taking to Cali in 1968. And it was rather an exotic location at a time when most North Americans had never been in an airplane, let alone to South America. And the, <laughs> it was billeted with this family in the mountains at the edge of trails that reached west of the Pacific. And I never saw the other Canadian lads. And I, you know, it was a kind of classic Colombian scene, children too numerous to count, uh, an indulgent father or a grandmother who muttered herself on a porch overlooking fruit trees, an angelic sister who more than once carried her brother and me home half drunk to a mother kind beyond words who stood by the garden gate tapping her foot on the stone steps pretending to be angry you know and for like eight weeks i encountered the <laughs> kind of intensity and joy of a people who understood the frail to the human spirit and many of the other canadian lads who were two and three years older than i was succumbed to what the colombians call mamitis or homesickness mm -hmm. and i by contrast felt like i'd finally found home and then some years later when I fell into the orbit of the legendary botanical explorer, Richard Evans Schultes, at the age of 19, I, I left for South America with a one-way ticket and a small backpack with just two books, Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman and Lawrence's Taxonomy of Vascular Plants. And, and at the time, you know, I believed that bliss was an objective state. And I, and I opened myself unabashedly to the world, both literally and metaphorically. And of course, I drank from every stream, including tire tracks in the road. And I was always sick, but that was even part of the process, you know, these <laughs> malarial fevers that broke with the dawn. And eventually I fell into the, into the uh, orbit of, of Schulte's protege, the late botanist Timothy Plowman, who at the time was just beginning his studies of coca, you know, the divine mm -hmm. leaf of immortality. And so it was my incredible good fortune at the age of 20 to become Tim's field assistant for over 15 months as we traveled the length and breadth of South America, attempting to understand both the botany, the ethnobotany, and the origins of a plant that had been revered in South America for 8,000 years and only lately demonized by the modern states who, of mm -hmm. course, under the weight of cocaine. It's interesting you say that because uh, my uh, one of my daughters is married to a Colombian and I've been there three times once for the wedding. and. When you go to the Museum of Gold in Bogota, the, it was absolutely clear that the gold wasn't of much great relevance to the indigenous peoples, but certainly cocaine was. And the, the sophistication of the, the religion and the attitudes and, and, and the way in which cocaine was prepared and carried around. Wait a minute. We're not talking cocaine. Coca is yes. to cocaine what potatoes are to vodka. And yeah. this is the essential point to make. And you know, that gold museum is an archive of remarkable artistic achievement, but it's important to remember that gold is a living entity in the Northwest Amazon. It is gold beneath the ground that illuminates the path of the shaman. And to this day, amongst the sun priests of the Arawakos, the Wiwa, and the Kogi, and the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, indigenous people who in a bloodstained continent were never truly conquered by the Spanish, they remain ruled to this day by a ritual priesthood. They call themselves the elder brothers and they dismiss the rest of us who have compromised the world as the younger brothers. And they still have gold artifacts from the time of Tyrona. And they still practice as they always did. And it's rather astonishing. The great sign of the wealth of Colombia, both culturally and biologically, and of course, historically, that 
two hours from Miami Beach, staring down on the very beaches where Columbus's men arrived 500 years ago, remain the sun priests of an ancient civilization. And they are still here today to inform us. And they still believe that their prayers and rituals maintain the cosmic balance of the world. And they revere Hayo, as they call coca, it's the coca of Colombia, as not just a sacred plant, but as, the, as a portal to every conceivable spiritual dimension. And so part of what we've been trying to do, and one of the reasons I was made an honorary Colombian citizen, is to tell the truth about Colombia and expose the cliches. You know, here's a country that, you know, has a 50-year war, 260,000 dead, 7 million internally displaced, a war that would not have lasted one day had it not been for the international consumption of cocaine. The blood of Colombian people is on the hands of everybody in London, in every cubicle of New York, in every glass-clad tower of Miami and Madrid who has ever used illicit cocaine. In the last year of the war, before the peace agreement that was negotiated in Havana and signed in Cartagena, and negotiated by President Juan Manuel Santos, for which he won the Nobel Prize for peace, the FARC were down to maybe 6,000 cadre, mostly kids in search of a meal and a clean uniform, and yet they made $600 million from extortion and cocaine trafficking. So if you give me the Boy Scouts of London and $600 million, I can wreak havoc in all of Southern England. And so the idea that Colombia is somehow uniquely a place of violence, as if it's in the character of the Colombian people, is an absolute disservice to the wonder of who they are. And in fact, it's only a people like the Colombians with their spirit that could possibly have endured the consequences of a 50-year war of rivers of blood that was only made possible by pro the sordid policies of prohibition and the, the grotesque consumption of illicit cocaine in the rest of the world. Yeah, well, I, absolutely. And I, I'm, as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm looking at my mantelpiece where I have a, one of those uh, devices, those, those jugs with the, the little balls at the top where they carried the, uh, the powder, I think, the, to mix with the, uh, with the cocaine leaves or the coke leaves. Yeah, it's not the cocaine leaves, it's hayo. The poporo is a symbol of the feminine. The, to change, to absorb the small amount of alkaloid that is found within the leaves naturally, you have to change the acidity of the mouth by the use of some kind of basic substance. You can baking soda, you can use various, you know, limestone, bicarbonate, baking soda for that matter. But I, I, think, I think it's important to, you know, really realize what's going on here, you know, which is that that, you know, this is a plant, I mean, one of the real ironies of the research that we did as long ago as the 1970s, and we were employed by the U.S. government, by the United States Department of Agriculture, and curiously, the efforts to eradicate the traditional fields of particularly Andean people began 50 years before there was a cocaine problem. It had nothing to do with cocaine and everything to do with the cultural identity of those who revered the plant. And in particular in Lima, when a series of physicians in the 1920s and well into the 1940s looked up into the Andes and they saw various social pathologies, poor nutrition, poor sanitation, illiteracy, there had to be a cause. And because issues of land distribution, economic inequity came too close to touching the bourgeois roots of their own lives in Lima, they settled on coca as the demon plant. I was going to say, that seems to have recapitulated you know, history 500 years before, yeah? Well, it's not so simple as that, because when the first Spaniards arrived, of course, they demonized anything that was of interest to the indigenous people and the great civilizations. But they soon found that it was impossible to work the indigenous people in the mines without a supply of coca. So the whole thing became inverted. And in fact, the Spaniards, within 50 years, had commercialized coca on a scale that was unknown even to the Inca. And in fact, the entire first 200 years of the, of the colony in the Americas was made possible by the revenues of the coca trade. So coca has incredibly deep roots, but those efforts to eradicate the fields, again, as I say, began. And during all those years, these physicians in Lima never did the obvious, a simple nutritional assay to see what the plant actually had in it. And when we did that, in the 1970s, what we discovered absolutely horrified our backers of the U.S. government because, yes, coca had a small amount of the alkaloid in it, the use of which was mediated by both the way it was consumed and, and other associated alkaloids and flavonoids in the leaf. But in addition to this mild stimulant, useful in a harsh environment, 
The plant was chock full of vitamins, so the daily consumption of coca, por ejemplo, in the, in the Sierra, more than satisfies the entire regime necessary as defined by modern science. It also had more calcium in it than any plant ever studied by science, which made it perfect for the non-traditional diet of the Andes, which did not have dairy products. It even had enzymes in it, which enhanced the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, which made it perfect for the tuber-based diet in the Andes. The point is that in 1975, when we finally did this study, we showed without any doubt that this was a plant that had been used with no evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, for over 8,000 years in the Andes. And even though we came up with that, it had no impact whatsoever on U.S. policies vis-a-vis -vis this magic plant. Yeah, so it's even more vilified than, uh, I guess, the cannabis plant and the opium plant in that sense, is it? Well, I think one of the problems is that the first alkaloid extracted from a plant was morphine from, from poppies, right? And because opium, the natural occurring drug, if you will, from the poppies also was a drug of some consequence and danger. I think people, when the second drug extracted uh, from a natural product, which was cocaine, there was a sort of, if opium's bad and morphine's bad, therefore cocaine must be bad and coca must be bad, when there was, the comparison was completely irrelevant. I mean, the truth of the matter is that the purer the drug, the greater the potential of abuse. I mean, we forget that, for example, uh, the French Revolution was caused by caffeine. You know, if you, if you go back to the history of coffee, it originally was a medicinal product. And then over time, and, and then it became a product of delight, and then it became a product to be eliminated. You know, the coffee houses emerge as sort of centers of intrigue. If you go back to the fact that until the middle of the eight, uh, 17th century, you couldn't drink the water in any European city without becoming ill. And so suddenly everybody was drinking spirits or mead or alcohol, one sort or of another, wine, beer, and the whole continent was mildly besotted. And then suddenly three central nervous system stimulants come along, chocolate from Guatemala, tea from India and China, and of course, coffee from Abyssinia and eventually Brazil in the New World. And all of these substances have to be made with boiled water takes care of the pathogen problem. And because they're substances of great value, they're distributed in these places that become specialized centers, the coffee houses and the, and the tea houses. And they were known as penny universities because in the, in the 17th century, you could go and pay a penny at Oxford and go in and listen to the finest intellectual minds of the era in debate, right? And in fact, the mob that stormed the Bastille began at Voltaire's favorite coffee house, the Café de Foy. And from really? there, they <laughs> went off to turn over the world. And then, of course, what happened is that the Industrial Revolution, everybody tried to outlaw coffee. I mean, Frederick the Great tried to get everybody back onto beer. The Sultan of, of Constantinople went around Istanbul, uh, Constantinople at night in disguise to behead anyone caught with coffee. But in time, coffee became civilized and domesticated because we needed it for the Industrial Revolution. You could yes. work a field, you could... You could make an implement by hand after a few tumblers of beer, but you could not work an industrial machine tool. And so what we did is we domesticated caffeine and we codified it as a coffee break. And we allowed a regular dose of the drug to be absorbed by the working people to keep them content and to keep production going. And so caffeine itself, it, like all drugs, has an ambivalent potential for good or evil. If you if you feed copious amounts of caffeine to rats, they will literally tear themselves apart to get more of it. In other words, the issue is really not good and bad drugs, but good and bad ways of using drugs. And, and cocaine is a terrible way, recreational cocaine is a terrible way of using the sacred plant. Cocaine as a topical anesthetic is a very useful and most powerful topical anesthetic that we have. That's a good way of using cocaine, but the best thing to do of all is to revere the plant itself. This is a critical thing. You know, it's not what coca is not. It's what coca is. Think about it. The entire world wakes up with a little bit of existential uh, malaise, does it not? Everybody's work these days is looking at a monitor for hours at end. Yep. What if I could tell you that there was a plant that had been used safely for 8,000 years 
that gave you a light, slight sense of well-being, a lightness to your step, an ability to focus for hours on end without having any sense whatsoever of being under the influence of any stimulant, let alone something as harsh and bitter as coffee or tea. And at the end of the day, having focused creatively on your task, you could simply walk away from your laptop, have a nice meal, go for a run, go to sleep, and go right back the next day and enter that kind of creative zone. Isn't that something that would be rather attractive? Well, that's what coca is, and that's what coca does. The point about coca is not simply that it's a sacred plant with 8,000 years of history or more, or that we know that it is incredibly healthy for the body, or that indeed it can be used medicinally for anything from high altitude sickness and soroche to stomach illnesses and any number of other syndromes. But the point is that coca can literally change our world. So the question is, why is it that when drugs such as marijuana and cocaine or marijuana schedule one by the DEA, which means a drug that is both dangerous with no practical application. Now marijuana is legal in countless countries, including my own Canada. The hallucinogens that are also by the DEA's estimate, schedule one drugs that are dangerous with no medical or useful applications they are now at the forefront of a revolution in psychiatry and in clinical treatment of any number of disorders that we suffer from. Then tell me, why is it that coca, which is in fact Schedule II, which means that it's a plant that has potential abuse, again, according to the EA, but known medicinal applications, why is this the one low-hanging fruit that remains utterly demonized when it is in fact the one plant can, that can bring more benefits to more people in more places than any other plant known to science? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I imagine you've got probably more insights in most as to the reasons for that. I mean, it, is it that governments just don't want your government in particular, the US? Let me, Dave, tell me a story. This is, this is kind of a great thing. On October 31st, 2020, WPVI Action News, which is an ABC television affiliate in Philadelphia, led its evening report with a sensational account of a rare drug bust at Philadelphia International Airport. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers, it was reported, had seized more than 12 pounds of what was described as green <laughs> cocaine along with a mysterious brown tar-like substance, which had tested positive for <laughs> nicotine. The powder had tested positive for cocaine. According to the authorities, the green hue was a way of camouflaging the drug, which through a chemical process using gasoline, ammonia, and other chemicals could be turned white. The implication being that ounce for ounce, it was just your ordinary blow tinged with another color. Now listen to this. This seizure, reported Casey Durst, head of CBP's Baltimore field officer office, perfectly illustrates how Customs and Border Protection officers use keen instinct and professional scientific analysis to intercept dangerous drugs being smuggled into our communities. In Cincinnati, Port Director Richard Gillespie heralded those singularly responsible for having, quote, kept this dangerous green powder out of our neighborhoods. Now listen. This is, you know, this is something I wrote in the recent essay, but because be beneath all of this righteous pose was in fact a farce worthy of Moliere. The source of nicotine reported, I knew immediately, it was Ambil, a native paste with very high concentrations of tobacco, an addictive lethal drug that when smoked is responsible for the death of 480,000 Americans every year. But tobacco being legal, that substance was no, of no concern to the customs agents. I also knew that the green powder, the green cocaine, was in fact mambe, a traditional preparation of the Northwest Amazon that as early as 1957, my professor, Richard Evan Schultes, had reported as a mild stimulant and essential component of the nutritional regime of all the peoples of the Northwest Amazon. Daily consumption more than 
uh, satisfy the recommended dietary al allowance for calcium, iron, phosphorus, vitamin A, and riboflavin. Uh, prepared, it's prepared from an Amazonian variety of the coca bush with notably low concentrations of the alkaloid, less than 0.5% dry weight. Mambe, as it actually was, not green cocaine, its food is much as stimulant and it's as innocuous as a cup of black tea or coffee and far better for the health. But here's where it gets interesting, Dave. The news reports from WPVI noted that the green cocaine had been sent to labs in Savannah and Newark for analysis, but not reported were the actual results of the assays, trivial amounts of cocaine, no more significant than the amount of caffeine in a coffee bean. And in fact, had anyone tried to snort the green cocaine, the mambe, they would have simply plugged their nostrils unpleasantly with a substance consistency of talcum powder. Mambe is always consumed orally. Now, to suggest, as they did, that smugglers might import mambe to extract cocaine, even assuming it could be done, given the large amount of ash in the preparation, makes about as much sense as suggesting that someone would import Dom Perignon to secure by chemical processing pure extracts of ethyl alcohol. Like champagne, mambe is a specialized item made by trained individuals on a small scale, a labor-intensive process that yields a highly valued and unique natural product. Drug cartels that have successfully shipped cocaine, real cocaine, by the ton into the United States for nearly 50 years, I promise you, are not about to waste their time with it. What, what in fact, listen, I mean, what in fact transpired at the airport in Philadelphia was a drug bust on par with Elliot Ness mistaking a truckload of potatoes for vodka and seizing the entire works as a violation of the Volstead Act. Now think about it. It's one thing to note with regret that after 50 years of a war on drugs, there are more people in more places using worse drugs in worse ways than ever before. It's quite another, Dave, to acknowledge that having spent billions of dollars a year on this misguided crusade, a trillion dollars altogether, our frontline defenders still do not know the difference between a pure alkaloid first extracted as a drug in 1860 and coca, a benign and highly nutritious plant revered today by millions of indigenous people and long celebrated by all the ancient civilizations of South America as the divine leaf of immortality. Well, you put it brilliantly. I can't, I can't really say anything to that at all, other than we, by the way, are having exactly the same discussions in Britain today as to whether you are allowed to sell full extract of hemp, because full extract of hemp contains a tiny I amount of things. I'd like to jump in there, Dave. You know, the thing is that the marijuana thing doesn't really show that we've learned much about the nature of human drug use. You know, you know, Timothy Leary was caught with one joint and he ended up in solitary confinement at San Quentin for months. Now we have marijuana shops in every corner as if, as if suddenly marijuana is not a drug. Look, marijuana is a powerful psychoactive drug. It's called dope for a reason. It ruins parties. It doesn't kill people, but it's not a trivial substance. Coca is not a drug. It's a plant. The use of coca is not like the use of cocaine. The use of coca is a meditation, not a drug. And to ask why the war on drugs continues, the answer is very simple. Neither side has the slightest interest in winning the war on drugs. If so, the agents of the DEA would be out of work and the prices would plummet so low that the cartel would be out of the greatest scam in the history of the world. Look, I'll tell you an anecdote about that. When Tim and I came back in 1975, having done all this work on coca in the employ of the USDA, the U.S. government, there was a job opening out at, at the USDA that my friend Tim told me to apply for, but he also told me that if I took the job, he'd kill me. And so I was curious. So I went out to the Beltsville, Maryland, and I found my way into the office of this corpulent bureaucrat who clearly was not USDA, he was DEA, head to toe. The first thing I noticed was he was a drug addict. I couldn't get in the office for the cigarette smoke. His walls were covered by seized drug paraphernalia, which was odd. It was like going to the office of an anti-pornographer and finding sort of pornography on the walls. 
And as I looked at him, he had, a, it was the 1970s. He, he had a red jacket, red hair, an open chest with a butterfly collar, gold chains around his neck, uh, gold nuggets on his wristwatch. And I'm thinking, where have I met this guy before? And it turns out that having all they had distilled from our incredible research was that Tim and I were good, good at finding coca fields. So what this fellow wanted me to do was go back to South America, secure the pests, be they fungi or, or insects, that predate on coca, that they could be brought back to America, manipulated to become more voracious, and then reintroduced to South America in what was clearly an act of biological terrorism. I'm looking at this guy, and I think, first of all, isn't this a little hazardous? And he put his big, meaty hand into his chest and pulled out gold dog tags with the names of his agents who'd been killed inscribed on the gold. You can't make this stuff up, Dave. And then as I'm looking at him, I walk out and I realize I've never actually met him before. I've met him a million times because he was the cartel. I mean, when I lived in Medellin in the early days of the 70s, I knew a lot of those guys because at that time, no one knew how sordid or murders it would become. And what I realized is that the energy of the two sides of the conflict are in a sense one and the same and that neither side has any interest in winning the war on drugs, right? And if so, their whole facade would collapse. And that is a good, and of course, I didn't take that job, but someone did. And eventually the USDA did try to introduce voracious pests in the plant, in plantations, and it only stopped because Bill Clinton recognized that, that diplomatically it would alienate Latin American countries because it was in fact a form of biological terrorism. So instead of that, we insisted on spraying the fields from the air. Rather than dealing with the problem at the source, consumption, we consistently export our problem to Colombia. Now, you know, Juan Manuel Santos in 2015 suspended that spraying program because it had no impact on production and it was poisoning Colombia's landscape and its greatest resource, which is its unique biodiversity unmatched in all of the world. And only in recent years has Colombia been forced, in the wake of the peace agreement, the Americans threatened to withhold aid of $800 million unless Colombia began to spray Roundup once again across its landscape. And this at a time, incidentally, where Colombia has been desperately trying to pay for the cost of peace, having drained its treasury for years to cover the costs of a war, a war that was only necessary and made possible by the sordid profits of prohibition. And at the same time, the Colombian people had absorbed two million refugees from Venezuela, and they didn't put them in cages at the frontier. On the contrary, they fed them, housed them, gave them medical care, shelter. They even educated the children, and gave the parents the right to work at a time when Colombia needed every single peso it had to pay for the cost of peace. And so, you know, the idea that America would withhold $800 million of promised aid simply and unless um, uh, the country began to poison itself again tells you something of the priorities that have driven this whole dynamic. Colombia is not a place of war and violence. It is land of colores y cariño, where the people have endured precisely because of their character, which is endured, endure, informed by an enduring spirit of place and the fact that they, they live in a land where heaven and earth converge on a regular ba basis to reveal glimpses of the divine. Yeah, well, so i thinking about it. I mean, it's, the moral argument isn't working. The economic argument is that uh, you've got you know, vast amounts of uh, individuals who need the war on drugs to stay functioning. Presumably, the only way to, to do anything about it is to have a more powerful economic argument, isn't it? Which is that if we stopped and then we could make coca available or other substances as well from Latin America, that'd be the way forward. I mean, the thing is, Dave, yeah, I mean, the only ultimate, I mean, for example, since the peace agreement, there has been more cocaine produced in 2019 and 2020 than any other year, you know, and the illicit nature of the trade only drives the cartels deeper and deeper into the forest, cutting down primary forests, even within the national parks, a system that Colombia has, which is sort of the envy of Latin America. There is clearly only one solution. You know, if any other 
public policy was absorbing billions of dollars of taxpayers' money every year and doing absolutely producing no evidence whatsoever that that funding had produced any results of whatsoever and in fact had only fueled the fires of war and created a situation that every year becomes worse and worse. Lord knows how those people would continue to be funded. But the war on drugs takes on almost a biblical crusade, and it also allows the Americans to avoid the fact that it is their social dilemma that so many of their people seek satisfaction in a drug best used to anesthetize, anesthetize the mouth before the dentist rips out a tooth. You know, and it's come time for us to reject this as a, a global population. The only way that Colombia will ever have the peace it so deserves and has fought so hard to achieve is with the cleansing stroke of legalization of all drugs, of course. But in the meantime, if we could make a nutraceutical market for coca leaves, I mean, marijuana became decriminalized because, first of all, people demanded it because it had medical applications. Coca has a plethora of medical applications that dwarf those of clinical cannabis. And what's more, coca has the promise to transform the lives of people everywhere in the world because it is not only a mild stimulant, it is by far the best and the most creative and the most positive and useful stimulant known. And so once people understand that and experience that, they will demand legalization. And once we can legalize the leaves, we can create a nutraceutical market so that the 130,000 families that today depend on growing coca for their livelihoods will have an alternative market to that of the cartel. But above all, through the legalization of ultimately all drugs, but cocaine, but in the short term, perhaps coca leaves, decoupling coca from, from cocaine, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Colombia could achieve the tax revenue to pay for the cost of peace, I mean, as I say, having drained its treasury over the years to pay for the sordid consequences. Well, I remember when I was in Colombia four years ago, my first visit, this was being discussed as an enormously powerful economic impetus, as you're suggesting, and maybe it was your, your own suggestion they were taking. But I gather, talking to my family over there now, that that seems to have slid backwards for some reason. Is that because the... No, I think, there's, I think there's a very strong, I mean, there's a very strong push still in all sectors of society. There's a, I think across the board, there's a sense in Colombia that people are tired of being demonized for a, a dynamic that, which, for which they accept responsibility, but not total responsibility, you know. I mean, the whole cocaine trade grew up as a alliance of, of Vietnam vets and and and, uh, and low life kind of drifters and grifters in Colombia, you know, and no one really grasped how enormous it would become how, or how sort of it would become. I mean, at the height of Escobar's cartel, the cartel in Medellin was budgeting a thousand dollars U.S. a week just to buy elastic bands, and so the consumption of cocaine and the generation of unprecedented floods of money would have distorted any country, you know? And at the end of the day, the question is, how are we going to escape this horrific situation? And the obvious answer, and it's not just a way of escaping it, it's a way of bringing benefits to the entire world, benefits that people can't even imagine. And I promise you that coca used as a nutraceutical has the potential to virtually displace coffee around the world simply because it is that much better, milder, gentler, and efficacious as the kind of mild stimulant we all seek when we go for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a chew of betel or, yeah. or whatever that stimulant may be. So we better not be making that too obvious in the short term because otherwise the, the, co <laughs> the cafe, coffee industry will be trying to block it. But do you think we could persuade them that this is this is the future and get the coffee industry no, engaged? I, well, I mean, I look, you know, coffee, all, all joking aside, coffee is a wonderful plant and it's a wonderful symbol of Colombia. And, you know, the coffee trade around the world is, is never going to be challenged by anything. We all know that, but it can be complemented by yes. a, a coke. That's when people have the choice. I mean, some people like tea, some people like coffee. 
most people, I promise you, you will turn to coca simply because it's it's so useful, right? And again, this, one of the things we're trying to do in our kind of efforts is to stop saying what coca isn't. You know, coca isn't cocaine or coca isn't addictive or coke, but rather to stress the positive, which is that, you know, only coca allows you to, you know, get up in the morning and, I mean, why do we have a cup of coffee to, oh, to polish the eyeballs? Well, well, coca, coca just lifts your spirit without you even having any sense of having taken any substance. And it gives you just a, a gentle sense of well-being to go about the day. I mean, people often say to me that, I, you know, I've written 23 books and you're so prolific. Well, without doubt, one element of that is that is that I've never been distracted because using coca, I can go right back to task and maintain a level of productivity that, to be frank, I probably wouldn't have found so without the access to this marvelous plant. You know, again, a plant that has been revered mm. by every civilization of South America since the dawn of civilization itself. So, I mean, because it's, it's scheduled, the leaf is, is, what's the leaf scheduling under the UN Convention? No, the interesting thing, the interesting and, and optimistic scenario, in a sense, is that in the United States, at least, coca leaves are not Schedule 1, they're Schedule 2, which means yeah. my good friend Andrew Weil, who's one of the world's authorities on coca in general, but medicinal applications in particular, as Andrew told me recently, a physician in America is legally allowed to prescribe coca leaves. The problem is there's not a legal source yeah. and there's not established protocols. The only legal importer of coca leaves in North America, of course, is Coca-Cola. And they import tons of the leaves every year. And that's what makes Coke, as opposed to Pepsi, the real thing. Uh -huh, I see. Yes. But the precedent's been set. <laughs> Maybe Coke should diversify into, into different kinds of drinks rather than just... Well, you know, the, the story of Coca-Cola is a wonderful story. You know, when, when, when cocaine was first isolated, it was seen as a panacea. Of course, we all know the stories of Sigmund Freud. And, and of course, it soon became, it was promoted as a treatment for morphine addiction. It became clear that the treatment could be as bad as the disease. But in the late 19th century, you could get cocaine, pure cocaine in any, in countless products over the counter in pharmacies. And in fact, the, the soda fountain in the American pharmacy was a kind of poor man's health spa and you'd go there to get Coca-Cola. And what initially happened is there was a, a wonderful chemist called uh, Mariani, a Corsican, who came up with something called Van Mariani, which was red Bordeaux wine with pure cocaine hydrochloride in it, uh, coca leaves, and uh, red Bordeaux and wine. And he marketed this and it was, to say it was successful, I mean, he was the only man to turn on several kings, several U.S. presidents, <laughs> and the rabbi of France and the Shah of Iran to, to coca. And then what happened is that the Pure Fruit and Drug Act was coming along in, in what, uh -huh. 1916, and the temperance movement was really strong. So a chemist in Atlanta bought the formula, sold it to another chemist in the Chandler family, and they took out the cocaine but kept in the flavonoids, and they substituted the cola nut with its caffeine, and then they took out the alcohol and substituted the bubbly water, and the result was Coca-Cola, which, and then the soda fountain became a poor man's health spa, and you'd go in there and you'd order a shot in the arm. And that's really, you know, that was the origin of, of Coca-Cola. But thinking about, I mean, is the way forward to try to get the, the UN? There are, and one of the things that happened is in the 1930s and 40s, remember I mentioned those the physicians in Lima. Yes. And they, you know, they, after World War II, there were a series of UN conventions on drugs around the world. And for example, the UN went off to study the coca quote unquote problem in Peru. And the head of the commission, who was a CEO of one of the major American drug companies, Burroughs Welcome, he famously announced at the airport upon arrival of the commission that the commission would conclude with the proposal of eliminating all coca in all places in all time uh, within 10 years. You know, and of course, this never happened, but it shows the utter bias of these UN conventions. And what we need to do is get some leverage with countries that are not signatories of those conventions. But the biggest challenge of all, I think, is the entrenched bureaucracy of the anti-drug warriors in the United yes. States and the entrenched power of the cartels in places like Colombia and Mexico. 
You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit like the marijuana business in only one sense, uh, Dave, is that if you remember when there was a referendum in California calling for the legalization of marijuana for, for private use, those most opposed to that referendum were the hippie pot growers of Humboldt County. They had no interest whatsoever in, drug, in marijuana becoming legal uh, because they were going to lose their huge profit margin. So, I mean, look, we have learned from going right back to prohibition, as everybody knows, that prohibition only results in criminality, uh, blood, death, murder, and worse. Well, that is true. Wait, wait, we're going to have to stop now because I know both you and I have, have things pressing. But I just wanted to say a little bit about we're going to be meeting next month, I believe, or at the end of this month at St. Giles House in Dorset in, in, in the UK because of the there's the Ethnopharmacological 55 meeting. And if you just want to say a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, this is a wonderful thing that, that really Dennis McKenna and his colleagues have come up with. You know, Dennis... Dennis is a really extraordinary phytochemist. And I think, you know, one of the things that's sort of funny, Dave, as you get older, you suddenly become a revered elder simply because you've survived. You know? and, <laughs> and Dennis and I go back as kind of almost not just friends, but brothers to like 1979, 1980. And I was very good friends with his, with his brother, Terrence. And we were all students of, you know, this incredible cadre of scholars, not just Richard Evan Schultes at Harvard, who was both my undergraduate and graduate mentor, but also Albert Hoffman and Gordon Wasson and anthropologists like Peter First and Johannes Wilbert, Harold Reichel Dolmakoff in Columbia, this incredible cadre, Weston Labar, the peyote expert. You know, there was, it, 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 there was this incredible cadre of scholars and scientists across all disciplines who became fascinated with these curious entheogenic or psychoactive plants long before there was, they were, you know, had been embraced by popular culture. And because of our good fortune, Dennis and I were, you know, in a sense, the scions of that, of those, of those incredible characters. And in a way, I think Dennis uh, has taken on the, the mantle in a way. And certainly five years ago, when he assembled a group of people in a two-volume publication to celebrate a famous meeting in the 1967 that really kind of crystallized the scholarship. And then he brought together another group 50 years later, and now we're five years on from that. And the idea is to kind of, you know, focus on the interdisciplinary quality of, of the cadre that has been drawn to these plants. And uh, it's going to be a big honor for me to be, to be part of it and to deliver a couple of keynotes, but mainly to be there to support Dennis, who, who I think is uh, just an extraordinary scientist and one who deserves a lot more public recognition than he achieves. Well, if you haven't listened to his podcast with me now, you can go and do that instantly. I'm looking forward to seeing you, Wade, at this, uh, at this meeting, because I'm presenting there as well, and we can talk more. And I'll just say one last thing is it the great thing about the EP55 is it's mostly online. So wherever you are in the world, you can register and you can listen in. And we're hoping to have to beat the last record. The last time there were 70,000 people who came in and listened in to part of it through the internet. We, we're looking forward to breaking that record, making it over 100,000. And I'm sure if you do log in, it'll be well worthwhile because we've got a range of experts, not just Wade and myself and Dennis, but loads of others and, and also young scientists and young, uh, young researchers too. So, so do make a point of trying to join us at uh, EP55. And and Wei, thanks again for talking with you, and we'll carry on this conversation and the meeting down in Dorset in a few weeks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. <laughs>